Well, welcome everyone. My name is Daytuan Thomas. I'm the editor in chief of Vibe Magazine, and I welcome you to Billboard Conversations in conjunction with The Hollywood Reporter and Vibe Magazine. Today, we're going to talk about the tough topic of police brutality and police reform. Uh, the title of the show is uh, Facing the Music, the Fight for Criminal Justice Reform in America. So we have an esteemed panel, um, a lot of good brothers in here. Uh, first off, we have Jason Flom. He is a longtime music industry executive and founder of Lava Records. He's highly informed with his work on the Innocence Project and his successful podcast, Wrongful Conviction, with Jason Flom speaks to the injustices that happen in the criminal justice system. He's also a friend. Justin Moore is a lawyer and advocate for criminal justice reform and social justice. His career has been focused on civil rights litigation, prisoner clemency, police brutality, among so much more. And he's probably the only other person on here that has an original DJ screw tape like me. <laughs> uh, we have the Grammy-nominated superstar singer Aloe Black with his strong ties to philanthropic action within the health uh, sector, as well as demands for criminal justice. New song with Blue and Exile is one of my favorites, American <coughs> Drum, African Drum. Thank you so much, fam. And we also have Hakeem Jeffries, who represents the 8th Congressional District of New York, which encompasses parts of Brooklyn and Queens, serving his fourth term in the United States Congress. Rep. Jeffries is a member of the House Judiciary Committee and the House Budget Committee. He's also the fifth highest ranking Democrat in the House of Representatives. On June 25th, 2020, the House of Representatives passed H.R. 7120, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which included Rep. Jeffries' bill, H.R. 4408, the Eric Gardner Excessive Use of Force Prevention Act to ban the use of chokeholds by law enforcement under federal civil rights law. And finally, we have the best-selling author, activist, Shaka Senghor. He was also my co-moderator, who I'll be taking leads from, as he's the person I call when topics like these arise. He is a leading voice in criminal justice reform and a senior fellow with the Dream Corps. His memoir, Writing My Wrongs, Life, Death, and Redemption in American Prison was released in March 2016 and debuted on the New York Times bestsellers list, as well as the Washington Post bestseller list, and Oprah's one of his best friends. So, fellas, we have a lot to get, get through in this short amount of time. I would like for Mr. Singor to go ahead and take the reins. First of all, I'm, I'm super honored to be moderating this panel, uh, to sit here with four of my favorite and, and most inspiring uh, men in my life uh, for various reasons. Uh, I was just super honest. So I want to just kind of kick it off. I know we're talking about facing the music and music has been such an integral part of social impact work and, and you know, civil rights uh, movements and things of that nature. So I want to start off with Congressman uh, Je Jeffries. Uh, first of all, it's good to see you again, brother. Great to um, see you, man. I'm really excited by the work that you've been doing and you know, you've been a leading voice on this bipartisan effort uh, to reform the criminal justice system. So with that in mind, I, you know, how do we leverage uh, the cultural impact of the music industry to really uh, help them understand the importance of, you know, bipartisan efforts, specifically around getting bad bills passed? And what has your experience been in that space? Yeah, no, great to see you again. Appreciate your voice, your advocacy, uh, and your leadership. And great to be on such a tremendous panel. So my view has always been that uh, we need to make progress whenever and wherever possible in the strongest possible way. And when you're in a period of divided government, the only way to ensure that occurs is to try and find common ground with the other side of the aisle. And that doesn't mean compromising your values, uh, but it means trying to figure out where the points of commonality are in terms of fixing our broken criminal justice system generally uh, and we have a lot more in common than one might expect with the other side of the aisle in that regard, uh, because they've concluded that the notion that America incarcerates more people than any other country in the world, and in fact, we know a significant number of those people disproportionately are Black and Latino, uh, a large number there for nonviolent drug offenses, 
Uh, and so we've got this over-criminalization problem in America uh, needs to be dealt with in a meaningful way. And we took a first step in that regard, Democrats and Republicans coming together, progressives and conservatives, the NAACP and the Koch brothers, the ACLU and the Heritage Foundation, and all points in between to get a bill to the finish line and get President Trump to sign it into law as a first step toward breaking the back of mass incarceration and laying the foundation of what needs to happen moving forward. This moment that we're in right now on police reform in some ways may be a little more difficult. However, we're pleased by the fact that the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which is the most progressive police reform bill ever to pass any House of Congress, did so with overwhelming Democratic support as well as some Republican support. And many Republicans who didn't vote for it have expressed support for some of its provisions, such as criminalizing the chokehold or establishing a national use of force standard. Uh, and so bringing together within the music space, using your cultural influence, your voice and your power uh, to elevate the public sentiment that something needs to happen will be incredibly important. Now, thank you so much for that, Congressman. Uh, speaking of, of musical voices, Aloe Black, uh, one of my favorite musicians and just favorite people uh, for how he shows up in the world. As you're listening to the Congressman talk about the usage of music in these spaces, uh, what are some of the things that you're seeing and hearing from your colleagues? And what is it that inspires you the most in regards to these policing reforms, but also in criminal justice overall? Well, thank you, Shaka, and thank you, Congressman. Uh, I hear from my colleagues within the music business that we want dramatic, transformative uh, measures to be taken to change policing. We are very, very happy and pleased, and we showed our support for the, the justice reform bill that the House passed on uh, last week. And what we want to do is find the way to encourage s the Senate to take this bill and find all of the pieces in it that matter the most from a federal level and enact them. And so one of the things that I've been really incur uh, trying to do is inform and educate everybody in the music business about qualified immunity, this Supreme Court doctrine that qualifies police to be immune from accountability. It, it qualifies all state agents, but in the way that the, the House uh, bill is written, it focuses on policing, which is why people are in the streets protesting right now. Accountability. Accountability is the most important piece that I feel like the federal government can manage right now. Everything else that's in the bill is absolutely necessary to send a message to state and local municipalities that these are ways to change and modify policing for the better. But the one thing that I know for sure that our lawmakers can effectively change should the Senate adopt this measure from the House bill is to eliminate qualified immunity. And I can't say it more emphatically. No, thank you so much for that. Jason, as, as, as I'm thinking about some of the younger up and coming artists, I'm a big music fan. Uh, a lot of the way that I show up in the world was inspired by Nas, uh, you know, phenomenal classic album, Illmatic, when he dropped One Love. As, a, as somebody who started a record label, uh, first of all, like, how do you end up in this space, um, you know, where you're not only one of the greatest advocates for ending the death penalty, but you're also hosting an incredible podcast that really talks about people who are wrongfully um, convicted. Um, you know, how does that work in your world? And what are you saying to your young artists? And if you had some of the younger artists who are like, you know, running the industry right now, what would you say to them? Well, I think it's, you know, social movements have been driven by music over time, right? And when we look back to the 60s and 70s, um, you know, I, one of the greatest examples, of course, was Kent State, right? And this feels like that kind of moment. And within, <clears throat> within days of Kent State, Crosby, Stills and Nash had that iconic, incredible, legendary song out Ohio, right? And everybody rallied around that. I think we're in a moment now where we're starting to, to see artists especially the young artists. You saw the video that H.E.R. put out, her put out the other day. That was so incredible. I put it on my Instagram, which if anybody wants to check it out, it's, it's Jason Flom. Um, and I think the, the artists are starting to, to post and, and tweet and retweet 
you know, my friend Alec Karakatsanis, who's really, you know, one, one of my great heroes of this entire, entire movement from Civil Rights Corps, he posted yesterday about how Louisville, and this is going to blow your mind if you don't already know it, but Louisville just passed in city council 24 to 1, an increase in the police budget by 750000 while taking $775,000 away from the libraries. Mm -hmm. So in the wake of Breonna Taylor, they're exactly wrong like perfectly, totally, absolutely backwards by 24 to one. So he posted that and I think Solange and the other artists uh, have reposted or tweeted it. And I think at a minimum, we need our artist community to come together and, and, and be vocal and ideally release music that speaks to this topic and videos that speak to this topic because we cannot let this fade. This feels like a, 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 a this is an overused phrase, but it really feels like a tipping point, and we have to change it wholesale. We can't dance around the edges. We need structural changes, and th and finally, there's awareness and there's movement. So, you know, I think the music industry it has to play a part in it, or we should just we should just stop doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, Justin, you know, every every time I get a chance to talk to you, brother, I always just think about. You know, you're a cool young lawyer. You know, I'm kind of like the hip hop lawyer, at least in my mind, that's what I'll be thinking. Uh, and I was like, if I was his age, that's what I would brand myself as a hip hop lawyer. Uh, but, but you know, as, as somebody who's working on some very tough cases, uh, you know, you've handled some cases that dealt directly with police brutality or misconduct. Um, you know, what are, what are you seeing from your colleagues? And what would you say to artists uh, who, who sometimes they, they may tweet out some things uh, but they just don't, may not have as much background information. How do we bridge that gap? And what are some of the things you would say to them? First and foremost, Shaka, what's up, man? Good to, good to see you, Jason. You got two of my big brothers on the call, so that's, uh, that's a blessing to be on this uh, conversation with you guys. But from what I've been seeing um, on the ground, amongst other folks who do this work, we see a lot of optimism for sure. I mean, the fact that qualified immunity is being talked about at length, um, you have people like uh, Rep. Jeffries who are actively trying to attack uh, qualified immunity and uh, sovereign immunity to, to ensure that people have access to the courts. So I think there is a lot of optimism from that standpoint. Um, one of the things that Jason just mentioned, though, that I think we need to, you know, kind of explain to the artist community too, even some of the even folks who don't um, have high profiles also, is that if we want wide scale change and reform, we got to include prisoners, man. Looking through the House bill and also the Senate bill, I didn't see anything that mentioned prisoners who have constitutional violations that they might uh, experience every day with prison guards. I think uh, officer conduct or misconduct extends into our institutions. So reading through that, I mean, obviously the House bill is the strongest bill that we have and the Senate bill is just incredibly weak. It's woefully deficient. Um, but I would like the House to take it a bit further and say, well, you know what, prisoners are experiencing constitutional violations also, but there's also a safeguard or a preventative measure that prevents them from getting into court, which is the Prison Litigation Reform Act. So even if we do do away with qualified and sovereign immunity, it's still going to be tough for prisoners to lodge their complaints in court against uh, officers or correction officers who violate their civil, right, civil rights um, so I think it's important that we actually expand the bills. And I think the music industry and those with uh, high profiles can provide uh, some of those, those deeper cuts into what we need to ensure that everybody is uh, provided protection by uh, this current piece of le uh, uh, legislation. I have I have a quick question for the for the whole panel, uh, shock included. Um, just piggybacking off of Justin's um, uh, phrasing. Isn't like uh, the the privatized prisons aren't isn't that the major issue? Isn't that one of the issues that leads up to everything else that we're going through right now as far as you know what we're fighting for in the house? Like to to be able to have that funnel go straight to privatized prisons, it's it, it was spoken about in Ava DuVernay's thirteenth. Um, it seems like that's the overstanding issue. With, with, any of you have have a, a a place on that? Yeah, I'll let the congressman speak first for sure. Okay, okay, sorry, but yeah, no, without question, the general what we would refer to as the prison industrial complex 
which is the notion that the uh, criminalization of young African-American men and women and or young black and brown men and women in totality uh, and their use as economic commodities uh, is necessary in order to sustain this system where certain communities benefit financially. And we see it in state after state after state. Inside the context of private prisons, but also outside of that context as well, private prisons have to go. And Loretta Lynch and the administration that was previously here was on that path to making that happen at the federal level. As soon as we get a moment to do it, uh, when we have partners in the Senate and at the White House, we're committed to doing it. And to Justin's point, we're absolutely committed to ending qualified immunity for prison guards as well. We thought about including it in this legislative effort, but then decided uh, that because there's some broader issues that we're gonna have to deal with on the prison reform side of the equation, uh, that we would address it in that context. And that has been a space, as we talked about, that's been bipartisan. But this clear notion, particularly around the failed war on drugs, uh, where you were gonna criminalize people send them to prison, fill the prisons up. And many of these communities, they are in down and out downtrodden communities where the automobile plant left, uh, the factory left, the manufacturing situation left. And then the decision is made in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s that we're gonna build prisons in their place. And the federal government was part of the problem in the 1994 crime bill because we incentivized prison construction to the tune of $9 billion and then told the states that if you want this prison construction money, you need to impose mandatory minimums or three strikes your out laws or get rid of judicial discretion or impose so-called truth in sentencing. So to the point uh, that one that you raised, it's a whole system that was constructed under the umbrella of a prison industrial complex. And that whole system has to be dismantled. You know, that's, that's a br brilliant, uh, really breakdown, uh, Congressman. And one of the things uh, that one of, I really think is important for people to understand is that the police brutality part of it, you know, as somebody who served 19 years in prison and experienced it firsthand, uh, but also witnessed it consistently over that time, is prisons are kind of like the testing ground for uh, how much abuse you can get away with because they're very clandestine and people aren't often, you know, really thinking about men and women who are incarcerated because of the marketing behind the war on drugs. And it created this fear-based campaign where it just made us uh, anti-human, you know, uh, super predators and, uh, you know, pretty much the boogeyman under the bed. And, you know, if you can dehumanize a person, it's easy to begin to... Um, abuse people in that way. And, and so we see that a lot in prisons. And so it's really important uh, for us to connect the dots with those two. And then a lot of the pools from which polices are coming from, as well as correctional officers, come from a similar background. There's a lot of military, military veterans uh, working in those environments. Um, and so you see that militarization happening and play out. And I think about the chokeholds a lot, because I think about how uh, men were subdued when they were in solitary confinement, where they would literally come in with six guys, the extract, extraction unit, and oftentimes they're putting guys in chokeholds after they pepper sprayed them. And I just remember on numerous occasions, always hearing a person say, I can't breathe. And it wasn't just because they were being choked, they were being pepper sprayed while being subdued. And so, you know, when I see these images, it all just brings back that familiar ominous feeling that I felt inside prison. So. Uh, thank you for asking that, that great question. I just want to pick up on what the congressman was saying, um, because two very important points. One is that drugs are not the problem. The drug war is the problem. Drugs have never been the problem. And we know that in places where drugs have been decriminalized, even in Portugal, where they decriminalized all drugs in 2000, there were no negative effects whatsoever. Crime didn't go up. Drug usage didn't go up. Overdoses didn't go up. Nothing bad happened. And when you look at drugs, the 
fact is that they're used as an excuse. They're used as the excuse. We're going to search your car because we smell pot. They try to use it as an excuse. That's why they, they, they killed Breonna Taylor in her sleep because supposedly she had drugs in her house. It doesn't matter. First of all, she didn't. Second of all, the cops that did it probably did. And third of all, it's always either the excuse they use after they murder somebody or the reason that they go and do an illegal search or stop or frisk or whatever it is. That has to go away. Drugs need to be decriminalized across the board. Second of all, I've been saying that, um, and Cassandra Frederic, who's leading the Drug Policy Alliance, has great things to say about that. I have one of my podcasts called Power to the People that people can hear and hear her speak about it. She speaks so beautifully about it. Um, the other point is, back again to what the congressman was saying, as we watch these disgusting, disturbing, horrifying videos of George Floyd and all the rest, we have to remember that it's happening every day uh, behind bars. We have 5,000 Americans dying behind bars every year, and nobody knows them. Nobody sees them. Nobody thinks of them. But we have to keep our eye on that ball. They're human beings just like the ones we see being killed in the streets. And the fact that they're being brutalized and, and many of them killed by guards is is un, unconscionable but it's also invisible and that has to change we have to recognize that problem and it's not just in private prisons it's in all the prisons uh private prisons are part of the problem but prisons are the problem shaka you mentioned uh, the, the the jails and the prisons and um i just wanted to address the the, the unions right the uh the prison guard unions the police unions the sheriff's unions that are so impactful in um, lobbying for uh, the way that they are able to operate. And I wanted to bring that conversation to Congressman. Um, what role do the unions play uh, in uh, making, making these kinds of uh, uh, egregious, abusive misconduct um, part of their system, but then how else do they play into your elections and the way that you know, politicians are, are engaging in order to get votes? Yeah, no, it's a great question, uh, Alo, and I appreciate you raising it because when we're thinking about transformational change, uh, you of course have to look in front of you and say, well, what are some of the obstacles uh, to moving away from the status quo? And one of the most significant obstacles that's been there, not month after month or year after year, but decade after decade, have been the police unions both as it relates to making a change legislatively and even in terms of how they work to shape public opinion. Uh, because the reality is for far too many police unions, even in the most egregious case, they see no, see no evil, hear no evil, acknowledge that no evil was done from their perspective. And, and to me, and I've said this directly to many of them, that has to be broken because, I mean, is there no boundary? Is there, is there no line that can be crossed uh, in defense of the perspective? Because, you know, if, if, if there's always a reason to brutalize someone in your view, then how can we ever arrive at some semblance of transformational change? Uh, so they, they've certainly been a large part of the problem, even on qualified immunity. You know, we've said, look, we can agree to disagree, but don't distort the facts. Qualified immunity doesn't relate to indemnification. Doesn't mean that someone's coming after your home in the context in which we're discussing it. It means we're talking about if there's a civil right statute, particularly one that was created in the midst of reconstruction, there should be a remedy and the notion that this judicially created doctrine exists, as you laid out, Allo, uh, and as Justin talked about, where effectively an officer is held to the standard of the least reasonable officer on the force. Mm -hmm. Now, if I was held to the standard of the least reasonable member of the House of Representatives, I'd get run out of Brooklyn. And the notion that you can have the ability to take your life of someone else or the, leg, or, or, or the liberty of someone else because you're a police officer and you're held to such a low standard is outrageous. Absolutely. And so I think if somebody is being an obstacle to making reasonable changes, then we've got to call them out on it 
Uh, and oftentimes in the police union context, that's what needs to be done. And if I could chime in, so, I mean, if we have determined that unions serve as an obstacle, we got to find a way to mitigate that, right? But it seems where their power really comes from is their political power, their ability to affect elections with their deep purses locally. We have uh, we had a local race out here where the union gave the district attorney around two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in a local election. That's a lot of money. If I'm running for DA, I'm going to be swayed and persuaded by that. Um, so I think it comes to a holistic type of approach, right? It goes back to campaign finance, which is not a part of this conversation, but it actually is. If that is their strongest, I guess, uh, way of persuading candidates to allow them to be effective. Because effectively, all unions want to support their laborers, right? I, I guess you can't begrudge a union for doing that. But if uh, supporting your laborers puts others in danger, then we got to find a way to weaken their political clout, so to speak. Um, so how, I mean, how can we tie in the campaign finance reform um, campaign along with this prison uh, reform campaign and, you know, I, I guess package it together? and give it to our musicians and let them know, like, this is how we can really affect change here, which is severely weakening uh, these police unions around the country. That's an important point. I'll jump in real quick uh, and briefly. I'm, I practiced law back in the day, so I'm kind of a recovering lawyer, and I'm gonna try not to go on and on and on and on. Uh, but uh, the first bill that we designated in this Congress under our new majority, HR1, was our democracy reform bill. Uh, that deals with a variety of different things, but perhaps most significantly campaign finance reform for exactly the reasons that you laid out. That in order to get to transformational change on substance, we have to break the system because the status quo relies on unregulated money that floods the system to try to elect certain people who don't share our values. And, you know, we passed that bill in the House. It, of course, is languishing in the Senate. And so we're going to have to deal with that in November. And hopefully we'll find ourselves in a place where we can make the type of process oriented changes that will facilitate the substantive changes that can thereafter be made because people are in office who share all of our values. You mentioned you mentioned that a, the bill is languishing in the Senate. And, you know, I realize that there is a, a method, there's a system, there's a history around how politics is done on the Hill. Um, I'm hoping that with the the movement that's happening right now in the streets, with the activists that's happening in the industry, with musicians, actors uh, and athletes, that we can push Capitol Hill to act for the will of the people and not just conduct uh, business as usual, but recognize that these are prescient and, and very serious uh, uh, requests and demands, and they have to act now. And I think, you know, when I when I hear what Justin is saying, what Shaka is saying, what Jason is saying, and, and thank you for hosting this, Datuan, this is really important for all of us as it, that have any influence amongst our fans to put pressure on the senators that need to make a decision now so that you know, they feel that pressure and they know that their constituents care uh, so that the, how the representatives recognize that their constituents care. And if it's uh, it's incumbent upon us as, as artists to take advantage of our platform to either write the song, to uh, write the op ed, to make the social media post that says this is what the action item is. Here is your representative. Here is your senator. Call them, tweet them, email them and let them know that this particular thing needs to change. And that's hopefully what we can really use this moment to create. Now that, that's absolutely important. And, and, and I really love what you're saying in that regard, because I think as somebody who does social impact work, what is it that somebody like me can do with artists to simplify the messaging, right? Our voting system is very complex. Um, and so a lot of times we get kind of caught up in the theatrics of it all. And then the real things that need to happen uh, end up not happening because just not enough people are getting out to vote. So what is it that that social impact people and activists who are oftentimes critical because we, we always want, you know, where are the celebrities at? Where, 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 when are they using their voice? What is the role that we can play to help ensure that the messaging gets out? And then I have a other question that's a little bit more selfish uh, and largely because I really care about people who do this work. 
what are the things that you guys are listening to uh, during these times to get you through? Uh, like, I'm a big music person, so I'm, 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 I'm listening to Curtis Mayfield right now and Marvin Gaye and just some of the classics. Um, and, I, and I say that because this work is hard. It's not easy. And times are hard. And I think self-care is an act of revolution in the sense that you can't fight for other people if you're not taking care of yourself. So those are kind of the two questions I have in, in just an in interest of time. And that's yeah, anybody. I'll take that. Um, so to your first question, how can artists and people with uh, high profiles help my work? So I'm actually working with Jason on a case right now. And he's been, you know, tremendously helpful with, uh, with that particular case. I, don't, I won't go into detail because there's some safety issues with the, uh, with the client. But I'm also working with Jay Prince, too, on the, Larry, on the case with Larry Hoover. Uh, that Shaka, you know about, and they have just been tremendous. I mean, just, you know, having the ability to talk to them and kind of understand how can we get this case to market so we can have people know about it has been something that has been really uh, uh, invaluable for me. Outside of the, uh, the actual tangible liquid resources that they provide too, but um, so I think more artists can get involved like that. I have another case right now. I'm working with DJ Mustard and Rock Nation with, and they have provided some similar resources for that case also. So just from those bare essentials, but I think the ability for an artist who has an incredible social media profile to post these cases, to keep them in the social, cultural milieu, so to speak, I mean, that is really hard to put a dollar amount on how valuable that is. I think if you can get someone to post something and say, we need you guys to pull up to a courthouse in Dallas right now, and we guarantee 500 people, I mean, come on. I mean, the district attorney or the police chief, they're going to see that and they're going to be frightened by it. And we don't want to you know, try and you know, move by fear. We want to move by love, but we need to move impactfully too. And I think artists, they provide that impact. So. Uh, for them to continue uh, doing that, but also, you know, talking to their other friends and letting them know, like, hey, this is how you can really get in the game and be impactful. I think that's going to be necessary. And what I'm listening to, man, I mean, Shaka, you follow me. Jason, you follow me, too. So you guys see me playing some wild stuff, man. It could be it could be Boosie one day, Jay-Z another day, Johnny Taylor uh, the next day after that. So, I mean, I immerse myself in what I've always immersed myself in. I go back to to the fundamentals of when I was a child. So, I'm listening to music when I was eight, nine years old, whether it's rap or the music that my dad put me on, which is Johnny Taylor or the Marvin Gaye. Keeps me centered, keeps me focused, and allows me to kind of, you know, get back to this childlike existence to where I'm not carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm listening to Eugene McDaniels. Uh, his seminal work is uh, Headless Heroes of the Apocalypse, came out in 1971, was banned by the Nixon administration. They called... Ahmed Erdogan at Atlantic and told him to uh, shut it down, basically. Wow. And um, th when when Marvin Gaye was releasing What's Going On and becoming the, uh, the sort of activist voice of the time, the real answers to what's going on was in that album, mm -hmm. Headless Heroes of the Apocalypse, and that's why the, that's why the White House shut it down. Um, and I, I feel like what artists can do is recognize right now that uh, you know voter suppression is real the the war chest that the republicans have to suppress votes about 20 million 20 uh, uh they're spending around 20 million dollars to suppress votes across the country and um they'll do things like in florida which was overturned luckily um banning voting on campus for college students right because they know that the 18 to 25 year old vote is important and largely progressive so what we need to be able to do as artists is encourage and not just encourage but sustainably help uh, voter registration processes if that means um, you know being part of the the, the lawsuits that um, that Mark Elias is doing to sue these uh, secretaries of state who secretaries of state just for a piece of, of information are the ones who control the voting process in any state so we need to put the pressure on the secretaries of state and say look we need vote by mail. We need more ballot places uh, and voting places. Um, and we need to be sure that people have access to register online since we, so not everybody can get out to go buy stamps or to, to, to buy envelopes. Um, and they sh should also engage in paying for it for the people. You know, voting is our right, but it's also a duty. 
And this, if we as artists can encourage the secretaries of state to make it easier for people to vote, um, we'll have really engaged in what democracy is. Um, so that's that's another part fight that I'm I'm definitely joining in on. I think uh, the organization Global Citizen will be will be doing that as well. So yeah, I know what I'm about to start listening to is Eugene McDaniel, thanks to Allo. But what I've been <laughs> listening to is Line the Family Stone. Mm. Um, you know, one good thing about being as old as I am is that I was able to go see Sly a couple of times in Madison Square Garden. I actually saw him get married on stage at Madison Square Garden when I was about 13 mm -hmm. or 14 years old. And it was, you know, transformative, as you can imagine. So that's what I've been rocking out to. And I have a new artist I'm about to release called Leo the Kind that I'm really excited about, too. So I'm just going to put that plug in there. But um, I think it's important to recognize I want to shout out the Dixie Chicks, now known as the Chicks because they've been doing incredible work as well. And I think they're an example and they have been for a long time. They've been walking the walk. And I think we need more people like them, more artists like them standing up, speaking out. Um, I think voting is so important. I mean, it's gonna sound like a broken record, but voting in local races, voting in DA's races, or most people think I'm not gonna go out and vote for that. I'll wait for the Senate or the, the presidential race or whatever it is. No, 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 that's wrong. Your vote in a DA's race could be the one vote that decides it. We've seen vote races that ended up tied, like literally tied. So you can't stay home. You cannot do that anymore. That's not an option, right? You got to go. And so for artists, if, if you're encouraging your fans, if you're helping your fans in any way to get out there, there's also a great um, new thing that a friend of mine just launched called Defeat by Tweet. I got to shout this out, Defeat by Tweet on Twitter or defeatbytweet.org. It's a program where... You can sign up and pledge a penny or a dime or a dollar. And every time the, the, the guy in the White House tweets, money is going to go to black-led organizations that are dedicated to getting out the vote and getting him out of office. So it's, a, it's really a pretty genius program. So it'll be, I mean, if we get this out there and the artist community can be so helpful with this, you could have hundreds of thousands of dollars or more going every time he tweets to help put him back you know, in the golf course or wherever the hell, somewhere else <laughs> other than genius. where he's at right now. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Defeatbytweet.org, <laughs> defeatbytweet on Twitter. Post it, tweet it, whatever you got to do. Let's get that word out there. And um, yeah, for the artists, for the artists, artists out there, I mean, I'm proud of what a lot of them are doing. Um, and I think we just need more of them. And I think, you know, shout out to you too, Dutch uh, Juan, for putting this together. I think the more of these things we can do, and, and also I just want to say, I mean, these are, for me, this is a, a great honor to be on this particular panel. It's actually, it's never hard for me to talk, but it's hard to follow you guys. So I'm just gonna say. So real. Can I, can I piggyback just real quickly on what Jason just stated? I think with local elections, it's important for artists and people with high profiles to get involved because if you look at what it takes for a candidate to win a local election, it doesn't take a lot of votes. You can boost the profile of a local candidate tremendously and they can win with an overwhelming amount of support versus their opponent. I mean, a lot of times artists get involved in national elections. Those are important, but uh, Rep. Jeffries, you probably could attest to this. If you had someone on the ground in New York with the profile of, you're in Brooklyn, right? Yeah. So the hottest artist out of Brooklyn who just really supported you. I mean, that would translate into thousands of more votes. And that'll create a public mandate in which, you know, Rep. Jeffries' uh, policy and agenda would be something that could probably get passed a lot easier. Um, so I think every city has a popping artist, right? At least every major city. Every state outside of like Idaho or Wisconsin or one of those states like that. But most, of the, most states have a popping artist. They need to figure out who those guys are on the ground, these candidates that are really pushing the agenda that speaks to the plight of the people trying to solve that plight and really get behind them and not wait for these national elections every four years. Um, so I think that's something that all artists can get involved with immediately. Yeah, that's a very important, that's a very important point in terms, you know, the twin pillars of our democracy really are protest and vote, right? Protests, we're seeing it, uh, the voices of the people uh, in the streets, and that is anchored, of course, in the constitutional principles of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom uh, of expression, the right to petition your government. And that's what people are doing, that's what artists are doing, uh, and that's been incredibly important. Uh, but when you're petitioning your government, you're most likely to receive a receptive audience if the people in the government, of the people, by the people, and for the people, share your values. 
So that's why voting has got to be connected to protest and the articulation of the issues that are of concern and that are of the urgent concern right now. And voting broadly defined, uh, as, as, as Justin and Jason and others have said, every single office, because far too often, right, we focus on the presidential election every four years. And then we're not even necessarily concerned with the House or the Senate. That's why Barack Obama got jammed up for six of his eight years, let alone being concerned about other offices you know, at the state or city level, many of which can be incredibly important in terms of making change. Two were mentioned, the DA's races, and we've seen a rise in progressive prosecutors being elected. We did it in Brooklyn in 2013 with the uh, election of the late great Ken Thompson, who freed like 22, 23 wrongly convicted individuals and set a national standard. Uh, and we've seen progressive DAs start to get elected all across the country. That's important. And Secretary of State offices because of the impact uh, on voting. And um, the, the amplification of artist participation at every level of the electoral process would be incredibly important uh, because as Justin indicated, you can have such an impact. It's hard to impact the presidential election, though we all will in some way, shape or form. You can really move and impact an election at the state or local level. That's what's up, man. I appreciate that. Uh, what, what, what's, what's that song? What's that music? You listen exactly. To? Shaka, you, know, you didn't let them off the hook. We needed that before we wrap up. We needed that. <laughs> well, I'll be, I, I'll be quick. It, you know, it's a combination of inspirational gospel. You know, he's able. Uh, we've come this far by faith, having grown up, you know, in the black church still. Uh, actively involved in the Black Baptist Church. Uh, and then, you know, 1990s hip hop, you know, the classics, Nas, Jay-Z, Biggie. Uh, depending, on, you know, depending on what's going on uh, on the Hill, sometimes it's the best battle raps. <laughs> Give me some inspiration, Ether, take over. You're not, you're not jamming Takashi 6 9 Congressman? <laughs> uh, no, no, I can't mess with that, man. <laughs> oh, man, we leaving that one right there. <laughs> I want to thank all of you, uh, Shaka, Jason, Justin, Allo, Rep. Jeffries. Thank you so much for this impactful conversation. This is needed for the people. Uh, once again, this is uh, Daytuan Thomas. Uh, just, just Shaka, one more time, man. I just got to give it up to you for taking the time out to do this and, and getting us all together and knowing all of us. That shows your work. That shows your work on so many different levels. Uh, this has been uh, Billboard Conversations, Facing the Music, the Fight for Criminal Justice Reform in America. I'm Daytuan Thomas. Thank you all.